It's been a little over a decade since the world experienced its last pandemic, the 2009 H1N1 swine flu. Between the spring of 2009 and the spring of 2010, the virus infected as many as 1.4 billion people across the globe and killed between 151,700 and 575,400 people. Now the world is in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic caused by a novel coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2. Having been through a pandemic in recent history, it seems reasonable to expect that the government agencies in the U.S. would be prepared for the next one. But there are some key differences between the 2009 swine flu and COVID-19 and the response to each of them. The 2009 flu pandemic was the second H1N1 pandemic the world had seen, the first being the 1918 Spanish flu, still the most deadly pandemic in history. The 2009 pandemic was caused by a new strain of H1N1 that originated in Mexico in the spring of 2009 before spreading to the rest of the world. By June of that year, there were enough cases that the World Health Organization declared the swine flu outbreak a pandemic. In the U.S., between April 2009 and April 2010, the CDC estimates that there were 60.8 million cases of swine flu, with over 274,000 hospitalizations and nearly 12,500 deaths. That's a mortality rate of about 0.02%. The mortality rate for the novel coronavirus is much higher so far, around 2%, although the number will likely change as more people are tested. That may not sound like a big difference, but when extrapolated, can mean millions more deaths. The 2009 flu pandemic primarily affected children and young adults. About 80% of the deaths were people younger than 65. That was unusual considering that most strains of the flu virus, including those that cause seasonal flu, cause the highest percentage of deaths in people aged 65 and older. But in the case of the swine flu, older people seem to have already built up enough immunity to the group of viruses that H1N1 belongs to, so weren't affected as much. So far, COVID-19 is most deadly for people over 60 who have underlying health conditions. Another difference is that flu viruses are spread in respiratory droplets and airborne particles, while 2009 CoV-2 is primarily spread through respiratory droplets and in some instances may be shed in feces. It's not yet known how important the oral fecal route of infection is, but it's just another reason to wash your hands regularly with soap and water. The symptoms of the swine flu were similar to those caused by other flu viruses, primarily fever, cough, headache, body aches, sore throat, chills, fatigue, and runny nose. Those symptoms show up between one and four days after contracting the virus. Doctors are still determining the full breadth of symptoms of COVID-19. So far, the clearest signs of the disease appear to be fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath. Other symptoms, including headache, sore throat, abdominal pain, and diarrhea have been reported, but are less common. And just like the flu, COVID-19 can cause respiratory issues that lead to serious problems, such as pneumonia. But some people with COVID-19 have mild symptoms, or they may not experience symptoms at all. The virus appears to have an incubation period between 4 and 14 days, which means an individual could carry and spread the virus for up to two weeks before experiencing any illness. The H1N1 flu was also less contagious than the novel coronavirus. The basic reproduction number, also called R0 value, is the expected number of individuals who can catch the virus from a single infected person. For the 2009 H1N1 virus, the R0 mean value was 1.46, according to a review published by the journal BMC Infectious Diseases. For the novel coronavirus, the R0 value is estimated to be between 2 and 2.5 at the moment. There have been a few differences in the way the U.S. responded to the 2009 H1N1 pandemic compared to the nation's response to COVID-19 pandemic. At the beginning of both pandemics, the genetic sequences of the virus were released to the public with remarkable speed so that countries could create diagnostic tests as soon as possible. On April 24, 2009, just nine days after initial detection of H1N1, the CDC uploaded a genetic sequence of the virus to the public database and had already begun development of a vaccine. Similarly, on January 12, 2020, five days after the novel coronavirus was isolated, 
Chinese scientists published the virus's genetic sequence, but that's where the similarities stop. Things haven't happened quite as fast or as smoothly with COVID-19 as they did with H1N1. The first case of COVID-19 in the United States was identified on January 20th, and the country's Department of Health and Human Service declared COVID-19 a public health emergency 11 days later on January 31st. In contrast, the U.S. declared the swine flu a public health emergency just two days after the first confirmed U.S. case in 2009. Within four weeks of detecting H1N1 in 2009, the CDC had begun releasing health supplies from their stockpile that could prevent and treat influenza. And most states in the United States had labs capable of diagnosing H1N1 without verification by a CDC test. Within four weeks of detecting H1N1 in 2009, the CDC had begun releasing health supplies from their stockpile that could prevent and treat influenza. And most states in the United States had labs capable of diagnosing H1N1 without verification by a CDC test. But diagnostic testing ran into significant hiccups when it came to COVID-19. On February 5th, the CDC began sending diagnostic kits for 2009 CoV-2 to about 100 public health laboratories across the country. Most of the labs received faulty kits, which caused a major delay in combating the virus. Testing had to continue exclusively at the CDC headquarters until the agency could develop and send out replacement kits. This meant that COVID-19 continued to spread undetected for weeks. The FDA commissioner announced on February 29th that the agency would allow labs across the country to begin testing for the novel coronavirus with their own lab-developed tests without prior approval, as long as the labs took basic steps to validate the tests and submitted an emergency use authorization application within 15 days of the notice. By March 10th, seven weeks after the first confirmed case in the U.S., the CDC announced that 79 state and local health labs in the United States could test people for COVID-19 but some of those labs are already running out of supplies to run the tests. Another difference is that this is the first pandemic in the era of social media. The wealth of misinformation about the disease has spread faster than the virus, as has blame for the virus. If we're going to be successful, we need to stop thinking like this and unite against the virus.